something, and I got a little bit excited about something he felt he had on his heart, so I want you to give Michael Thompson a good North Island Church welcome this morning. Mike is in the house. I want to warn you, the Holy Ghost don't play fair. I'm about ruined. I'm not kidding. I feel like Lucy, you know, on Vita Vita Vegemin. That's <laughs> Woo! Woo! I don't know whose hanky this is, but you don't want it back, I can tell you that. <laughs> when I was growing up, they used to sing it, had birthday song in church, and they used to have hanky waves. Yeah. I'm about to have one of them right now, I'm telling you. Anybody go through something really amazingly wonderful recently? You just, I mean, it's like take your breath away, wonderful. Anybody go through something like that? Jesus is better. Anybody go through some real junk lately? Just feel like somebody knocked the soup out of you and sucker punched you? Jesus is bigger. Anybody fighting illness or? Facing physical stuff that really messes with you? Jesus is healer. Yes. Walked into the uh, prayer room this morning and sat down. Was, was it Laquanda that had her baby? Yeah. I sat, at, sat down next to that baby and I about lost it. I'm not, that's the beginning of getting undone because of the season we're in. It's the season of the baby. Yeah. And as I, uh, as we celebrated Thanksgiving, we were privileged to go to Austin, Texas, where our daughter and son-in-law live, and spend a week with Laura Noel, who is their new baby, two months old. It's our number eight grandchild. And the last night that we were there, I was holding her as I did most of the time. Diane had to wrestle her away from me. <laughs> and I was in her room, the lights out, ro trying to rock her to sleep in her little hanging chair, and I was humming to her and singing to her. And I started to cry. And I thought to myself, you know, baby makes all the difference in the world. You know what I mean? Baby makes all the difference in the world. Every one of our three that we've held, every one of these aunt, grand, eight grandbabies we've held, every one of them made all the difference in the world. But there is one baby that we're fixing to celebrate this month. And he made all the difference <laughs> in the world. He made all the difference in the world. Think about it for just a minute. God, in everything that he is, took everything that he is and reduced it to a zygote in a womb. And that fetus developed just like every one of us. But that baby is God in our skin. God with flesh on. God that got held like I was holding little Clara Noel. And I wonder, I just wonder if maybe... Mary held that baby and looked at that baby like I looked at Flora and said, you're going to change everything. <laughs> Everything's different now. Oh, the overwhelming, reckless love of God. How? crazy that God 
would take on our skin so that we could know what the Father is like. We never have to guess anymore. Ever. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit of a Christmas freak. I love it. A couple years ago, we were moving from our house to the house we downsized in. We didn't have Christmas. We were homeless for a week between right over the Christmas holidays. So I told Diane, we've never done that again. <laughs> so last year and this year, we went a little crazy. We, I love it all. I love the Christmas. We have three Christmas trees in our house. And, and I love the songs, and, and I've already watched Elf, and I, I got the whole line of it. I love it. But there has been this tendency in our culture with the commercialization of Christmas, such a degree that, I mean, we spend $700 million over Christmas this year. Seven. The average person spends $800 on Christmas. We spent four and a half million dollars on Christmas trees. It used to start, you know, later. Now it's, they call it Christmas creep because it keeps getting earlier. You notice that? That commercialization of Christmas has led to the secularization of Christmas. You ever notice that? We don't have Christmas parties anymore, do we? We have holiday parties. You don't get an answer on the phone very often that says, Merry Christmas, it's Happy Holidays. And and it's, you know, every year there's four, five, six different lawsuits where people are suing their city to keep a crash from being put up. So the world, with its commercialization, has secularized Christmas to such a degree that they've trivialized. And the world would like us to believe it's not about what it's about. Santa's the big guy now. You know what I mean? Let me tell you something. In the words of Patrick Swayze, no one puts baby in a corner. (laughs) I don't care what they do. You can't put this baby in a corner. You won't relegate the king of kings to a corner. No sickness, no disease, no demon of hell, no priorities of the culture will ever push him aside because God came as Jesus, a baby, to be unignorable anymore. That baby born in that day unnoticed by his culture, bent time around his birthday. So we talk about A.D. and B.C. He bent history around a stable and a manger. He will not be ignored. I want you to look at a scripture with me. Thursday morning, we were sitting on the back porch as we often do, we live on a little lake, and we were sitting there, and that's where we do our quiet time, and I read a lot out there, and just sitting there thinking about Advent. See, I don't, I celebrate Christmas, but I honor Advent. Advent is the word that the church uses to refer to Christ's birth. It's the coming. The second Advent is also the coming. When the one that came the first time as a baby comes back the second time as king of kings and lord of lords and he will reign forever and ever the advents i honor advent as the season the coming and as i was thinking about it i was taken back to this scripture you all know it it's in luke chapter one verse 29 this is when an angel shows up to tell mary what's up He says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. That's what I mean. Like for me this morning, Holy Ghost didn't play fair. Holy Ghost didn't play fair. An angel shows up and says to her, you're blessed. And she goes, what's up? 
She knew enough about God that when God sends an angel to show up, everything's going to change at that point. She was troubled and wondered what kind of greeting. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. He says to her, look, I know you're a little freaked out right now because when angels come from God, things that usually get turned upside down. I want you to calm down and not worry about it. You're going to be pregnant. That didn't calm her down at all. We were setting up one of our trees in our house and had our 14-year-old granddaughter over and Nina was asking us questions about Christmas. And I just turned around and I looked at her. She's Hispanic. Her mama's Mexican. Um, and she's got long black hair. Beautiful, beautiful girl. I turned around and looked at her and I said, you know, Mary looked just like you and was about your age. And she just looked at me and kind of went white in the face. <laughs> thinking about as that little 14-year-old girl having an angel stand in front of you and say, calm down, everything's going to be all right. You're getting pregnant. <laughs> that, does, that wasn't a calming message. You will be with child. And you're going to have a son, and you're going to call him Jesus. Now, Jesus is the Greek version of the name Joshua. Joshua comes from two Hebrew words. Jehovah saves. That's what Jesus means. But get this. Jehovah was the name that God used to reveal himself as the God who exists. It's, it comes from Yahweh. Yahweh in the Hebrew doesn't have any, uh, it doesn't have any vowels. So you know how it's pronounced? Wind, Yahweh, and when he uses the name Jehovah, or when he says that to you, he's saying, I am. I am more than breath. I am closer to you than your breath. I exist. And the word saves, the other part of his name, it means to rescue. So he's saying, you're going to have a son, and you're going to call him God who exists to rescue. God's whole existence in Jesus was a rescue mission for every person who ever drew breath to bring them back to the Father. Jesus is God existing to save, to rescue. He says, you're going to call your son God the Rescuer. Now, maybe you've never been where you needed rescue. But I have. Mac knows that for a fact. He, he was there when the shrapnel was flying. Jesus is God existing to rescue. You got any kids that are wandering, struggling? They're out there and they're just a mess. Jesus is God who exists to rescue that child. Yes. Got any family members who are just out there lost as a goose? Jesus is God who exists to rescue. He said, you're going to call his name Jesus, God who exists to rescue. And then he says this, he will be great. The Greek word is megos, where we get our word mega. He will be mega. Think about it. Whenever we use that kind of as a prefix to anything, you know what it means? It's bigger. 
whatever was mega that is bigger than it was. Yeah, yeah. I'm mega Mike because when she married me, I weighed 129 pounds. <laughs> There's a lot more of me than there was then. Does that make sense? I get the idea? Mega always means it's bigger than it was. He will be great. The word is used in largeness of stature, in broadness of scope, and in loudness of voice. Jesus, he, she said, he, the angel is saying, will be bigger than anything. He will be broader than anything. He will be louder than anything. Jesus will be bigger than every obstacle you ever imagined. He will be broader than anything, so he will cover everything. And he will be the loudest voice of all the voices you will hear. When I, when I read that, here's what came to me. He is bigger than any reality I face. He is mega. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, that, that was so well illustrated so many times in his life. You know what I mean? He, was, he would show up, and no matter how big the problem was, he was always bigger. And I thought uh, specifically about the story where the disciples are out with him, and they've got 5,000 men plus women and children following them. And Jesus goes, hey, boys, time for lunch. What you got? And they're, you know, they're like, eh, we don't have enough. And Jesus goes, wait a minute, you've got me. And if you've got me, you've always got enough. And he's, they say to him, but there's all these people and we got five loaves and two fish. And he goes, oh, we'll have leftovers tomorrow. Because he was mega. He is bigger than any reality that we face. Larger than it. Some of you probably are staring at some realities now, and you feel a little bit like David standing in front of Goliath. It's big. It's large. It looms in shadow over you. But I want to tell you something. It comes to you with sword and shield, but you stand in the name of the God who rescues. You see, the reason the name Jesus is so powerful isn't the five letters. It's what that represents. So when we speak Jesus, we're speaking bigger than whatever we face. Listen to what Paul said. This scripture has haunted me recently. It's in Colossians chapter 1. starts at verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created. In him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. In him all things hold together, and he is head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the preeminence, mega. So he shows up to this little 14, 15-year-old girl, scares the bejabbers out of her to tell her, you're going to, you're going to name your child the God who exists to rescue. And I want you to know, first thing about him is he's bigger than any reality anyone's ever going to face. He is great. We sang about it this morning. And then he says, he will be called son of the most high God. That's how this translation, the literal Greek says he will be called son of the highest. Not referring to the person of God, but referring to the heavenlies. 
He is son of the heavens. The second thing this said to me Thursday morning was that he is close enough to understand any struggle I have. He is son like me. He was Mary's son. He was Joseph's son. He was son of David. He was son of man. He was son like us. He walked in flesh. But the difference was he was son of the heavenlies. So he had an earthly attachment, but a heavenly perspective. He had a temporal connection, but he had an eternal origination. You get that? I was out, I was at my boss's house one time and we went out on his boat and his son came with us and he brought his drone. He has one of those big monster drones and he launched that thing as we were going out and he had a camera on it and he followed the boat all around. And when we got back to the house, he whipped out that camera and stuck it in his computer and he is playing this video. And I'm watching the boat I am on from a different perspective. And it's amazing what I didn't see from the boat that I saw from the drone. Understand? He is son of the highest. So he is son. He understands everything we go through from a different perspective. Here's the deal. Faith is when we get a word from God and we believe that word above everything. But there is something that's higher than faith, and it is trust. Because trust believes in the character of God even without a word from God. Faith, I believe God is great. Trust, I believe God is great. Little kids have it right when they pray for a meal, don't they? God is great. God is good. So he is the son of the highest. He sees things from a different perspective. He literally is able to feel with everything we have. Other Hebrews says we don't have a high priest who can't be touched with our feelings because he was in all points, just like we are, tested, except without sin. So he had that other perspective. I, I thought about this in his life, and I, and I remembered the woman with the issue of blood. Do you remember her? Twelve years, she leaked life every day. Life is in the blood. She was leaking life every day for 12 years. That condition in her culture alienated her. She was alone. She was rejected, not just by people in society, but by family and friends. Her closest relatives could not touch her without being themselves defiled. So she walked leaking life in a cloud of defilement. And, it, and worse than that, she went to doctors of every kind and spent everything she had, and the scripture says, and she was no better. So not only was she alone in a cloud of defilement, leaking out life every day, she lost everything she had. She lost everyone by the disease and everything by trying to treat the disease herself. By the way, that's called addiction. That's what addiction does. It's something that causes you to leak life, and as you're trying to, do, to take care of that on your own, in your own way, you lose everything you have. She lost everyone and then lost everything, and she literally has nothing else to do. So she says, what have I got to lose? I'm going to go find out if this Jesus is who he says he is. 
she elbows her way through a crowd. You realize she defiled every person she touched. She didn't care anymore. She had nothing left. She reached out, slapped it, rim, uh, the, the hem of his garment, stood up and was made whole. The Bible says from that moment, just like that. The bleeding stopped. The defilement was gone. She stands whole. She's ready to go home. But Jesus realizes there's something else she's struggling with that hasn't been dealt with. It was the result of her brokenness. So he stops and he said, who touched me? His disciples, as they normally were, cued in and sharp as they were, goes, oh, there's a hundred people around here. What do you mean, who touched you? I, I, can you imagine, don't you think Jesus like had a permanent spot on his forehead from going, no, I don't mean that. Somebody touched me. Somebody got to me. I want to know who it is. He turns around and the woman falls on the ground. She thinks, I'm in big trouble. I've defiled all these people. I reached out and touched him, which means I defiled him. And he turns around and you know what he says to her? Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go, Daughter, why? Because remember, she lost everyone. She was alienated and isolated, and the physical healing wasn't the biggest struggle she was having. It was all the result of that. And with that one word, he reminded her of who she really was. He is the son of the highest, man with God's view. That's really important when you're going through stuff and you don't have a clue what's going on and you look around and go, God, what in the world are you doing? Remember, he has been there. He prayed in the garden. God, if there's another way, Let's go that direction. But he had a different perspective. And just like that drone my boss's son had, it's amazing what we can't see from our defined, limited perspective. But he has our heart and God's mind. And then he says, and the Lord God will give him the throne of of his father, David. When I read that, here's what came to me. He is strong enough to defeat any enemy I battle. What spoke to me was the word throne. The Lord God of heaven, who is over all, through all, and in all, gives Jesus a throne. It's interesting, in the original language, the word throne always has this piece attached to it that gives you the image of a footstool. There's never a throne without a footstool. So the picture is Jesus has a throne and he's got his feet up. Why? Because Jesus doesn't even have to get out of his chair to handle anything you're fighting. He just sits there, feet up on the footstool. Heaven is my throne. What's his footstool? Earth. He just sits on his throne with his feet on the footstool. And he can defeat any enemy you're battling. It is the throne of his father, David. He wanted to make sure we understood that Jesus' throne is here, now, not there, then. It is the throne of David. That's earthly. The kingdom of God is not about heaven out there somewhere. It's about heaven here now. He doesn't reign then. He reigns now. He was given by the almighty God the throne on which he could sit and he could defeat every enemy. That's really big when you're fighting something and you're not winning. And face it, we all have been there. Some of you are there right now. 
you're fighting and you're fighting and you're fighting and you're losing and you're getting whipped up and you're constantly in a sense of defeat. Understand who Jesus is for you. He is the Lord who sits on an earthly throne in the midst of your mess. And he can deal with whatever you're fighting. I thought about when Jesus got in a boat and said to his disciples, we're going to go across the lake to the area of the Gadarenes. There's somebody over there that needs me to fight for them. He gets out of the boat, and a man described as someone who lived in the tombs. He lived with dead people. And he was so out of control that he couldn't be controlled with ropes and chains. So he was somebody who lived in death to such a degree that nothing could get to him. I don't know why he ran at Jesus. Have you thought about that? Because if you read the scripture, it said everybody in the area was scared to death of him. So don't you think he had a habit of running at people? Just like a wild maniac, wild eye. You don't smell good if you live with the dead, so he's stinking and he's wild eyed and he comes running, and people were scared to death of him. Difference was who he came running at that time, because that guy wasn't scared of nothing. So the wild man comes running, and you can see the demons in hell driving him, and all of a sudden they open their doors. Dirty eyes and looking at, oh, Lord, what have we done now? Because they knew who just got off the boat onto their turf. He came to their turf to get his guy from their hands. And he falls at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus looks at him. He's not even talking to the guy. That deal is done. He said, hey, you guys inside, hey, hey, you inside, what's your name? <laughs> you ever think about that? He wasn't talking to the guy. He, he, did Jesus ever need anybody to tell him anything? I mean, he knew what the Pharisees were thinking. Read it all the time, and he tells me he knew what they were thinking. He turned around and said, why do you keep thinking? They're like, thinking? So he knew the man's name. What he wanted to do was identify his problem. He said, what's your name? You, in there, what's your name? We're legion. We're thousands. Jesus goes, yeah, big deal. All thousands of you, you out of here. Isn't it like the enemy to come up with an idea that he thinks is going to work? Send us to the pig. What, is, what are these demons thinking? The pigs are going to go, oh, cool. We got demons. But they, they're trying to figure out how they can stay in the territory. Because you know what their mindset is? When Jesus leaves, we're getting our guy back. And Jesus says, sure, go ahead. Let's see what the pigs do when they get you. And off the cliff they go. Out of the territory, out of the man's life, at the word of Jesus. Why? Because he's sitting on the throne with his feet up. Not worried one bit about something named Legion. Remember who the angel, I want to keep going back to this. Remember who the angel is talking about. A baby. You ever think of this? God as a zygote. God as an embryo is prophesied to be greater than every other force of every other human entity in all of history. Take the worst of all the dictators, put them together, Caesars, Hitlers, Mussolinis, all of them, put them all together, and the baby as an embryo in the womb of Mary is greater. He's over because his father gave him the throne in the earth. As much as I like thinking about God seated, Jesus seated at the right hand of God, I don't want to forget he's also seated on the throne here among us, in this world, in this life. 
And then the angel wraps it up and says, um, one other thing. He will reign over the house of Jacob. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. You know what he's saying there? He is smart enough to fix every failure we ever endure. I was telling Diane when I read this, it was like I got slapped in the face because he says to Mary, hey, he is going to sit on the throne of David, but he's going to reign over the house of Jacob. He didn't say the house of Israel. You know who Jacob is? It's Israel on its bad day. You remember that? Jacob was the deceiver, the heel grabber, the twister. He was the pre-Bethel Israel. He doesn't say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, he's going to reign over the house of Israel. You know, the people of God, when they got it together, he's going to reign over the house of Jacob. That's the house when it's a mess. He will reign, which means he will have active rule, making decisions for the betterment of the house when it's a wreck. That ought to say something to us in this country right now. He reigns over wrecks. Thank God. Now, I know I'm, in, I'm church full of good people, but some of us other folk, thank God he reigns over wrecks. Jacob was Israel when the people of God weren't being the people of God. And he said he will reign over the house of the people of God, even when they're not being the people of God. And of that reign, that kingdom, there will be no end. Two meanings to that. One is it's never going to cease. And the other is there is no extremity over which the kingdom isn't bigger. So no matter how bad the world gets, the kingdom is greater than that. Where sin abounds, grace superabounds. Grace mega abounds. You see, I think every single word the angel was saying to her was important. It wasn't the house of Israel. It was the house of Jacob. It was the house that was a wreck, but he will reign over it. I thought about that. You know, he fixes every failure. He turned Jacob into Israel, and it all happened on a mountain with an encounter with him. Every time we encounter him, he starts fixing failures that we go through. Jesus said that Peter was going to be the rock on which he would build the church and the very gates of hell would not stand against it. Jesus, Jesus was saying to Peter, you're going to be the first, the forefront. You're going to be the cutting edge. You're going to be the pulpit of the boat. You're going to dive in and you're going to rip hell apart. But before you do that, you're going to deny me three times and you're going to retire and go back to fishing. You ever think about that? After he failed... He fished. He told the other disciples, I'm going back to what I know how to do because I don't know how to do this Jesus thing. So he was going back to fishing. But I, I just want to warn you, I don't care where you go. He got there first. Jesus got there first. They're out fishing all night. To show you how dense his disciples are, Jesus asked them the exact same question he asked them the first time he ran, and ran into them. You got any fish? And they look over and go, nope, not a thing. How do you not get it? Then he goes, hey, let's do what we did before. Let's put the nets on the other side. And they do it, and it isn't until the boat starts sinking that they go, 
Peter puts on his clothes to go swimming, which I never could quite figure that out, throws his cloak on, dives into the water and swims over. And guess what Jesus is doing? Cooking breakfast with fish. How'd he get them? Here, fishy, fishy, fishy. He's standing there cooking fish. And they're dragging the nets in, and they're like, where did he get the fish? Wherever we run from him in our failure, he's already there. David said, if I make my bed in hell, you are there. He is the God who exists to rescue. So wherever you're running, guess what? Already there. Jonah tried that number in the Old Testament. You would think we'd learn from it. So what Mary is running into here is a God who sends an angel to her and says, now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to reduce myself to one of the smallest entities on earth, seed. And I'm coming to get you. I'm coming to get you. Nobody puts baby in the corner. So this Christmas, that's the baby in the manger. That's the baby in the manger. Recalculate. <laughs> How many of you need to be recalculated today? Recalculate. Yeah, that was a good word. <laughs> well said, too. Well said. Yeah. So uh, let's pray. Mm -hmm. That's all that's left to do it here. So, Father, we, we thank you for for the word that establishes and reestablishes and reestablishes and reestablishes itself continually as we are willing to be confronted with it. The confrontation is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever, you are there. We can't go anywhere that you aren't there. And your pursuit of us is unextinguishable. And we appreciate that. But, Father, sometimes our perspective get skewed by the circumstances and the issues that we find ourselves in, the hell that seems to show up at our doorpost, doorstep, the things that, are, that, that, that bring fear and discouragement and confusion. But every time your word is delivered, every time your word it confronts us, it confronts us with that one thing. You are always there. You've never left. You've never forsaken. Lord, recalibrate our hearts this morning. Turn us back into a place of understanding so that we're not confused by anything that comes our way. In the name of Jesus, cause our perspective to be sure and that we can take a stand in the things that you've called us to take a stand in, the way you've called us to take a stand and the authority you've called us to take a stand, and that we would be people that not only take a stand, but take ground for the sake of the kingdom. In Jesus' name. Father, I ask that through the perspectives that need to be recalculated, recalibrated and recalculated would be done today in the name of Jesus, and that your truth would reign over every confused spirit and mind and every circumstance we find ourselves in. Thank you for your truth that reveals that you're great, but you're also good. In Jesus' name, amen. I have to say this. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. 
every knee will bow at the name of Jesus. I'll never forget one time I went to a Christmas party and I saw a picture of Santa Claus kneeling before baby Jesus. Santa Claus might be big in the world, but he will bend his knees to Jesus. Your circumstances will bend their knees to Jesus when you speak Jesus over them. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Amen. That's a good word. Let's thank Mike for coming and being with us. Thank you, Jesus. Let's thank, thank the Lord for Mike Thompson. Yeah. Who else? Can they? Or ask them. Yeah. So that, that's a good idea. If something has touched you in your heart, you'd like to have Mike and Diane pray for you this morning. They're willing to make themselves available this morning. And uh, we're going to be moving some chairs out of the way here in just a minute. So if you'll stick around and give us a hand, it'll only take about five or ten minutes. And uh, we'll keep the area up here for prayer. Can you guys help us with some prayer this morning? We've got prayer teams. If you need prayer this morning, come on up. Remember, tomorrow night, 6 o'clock, bring a dish and enjoy the wonderful succulent food that we're going to be providing. Vegetables or desserts, yes. So I ask the Lord to bless you today and to keep you. I ask the Lord to make his face to shine down upon you and be gracious unto you and to lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Merry Christmas. It's going to be a great week.